makes you feel how the artist was thinking, how he was working, how he decided on using what materials, how his forms came into being. Well, Patsy Nash was the true collector. She studied art and she loved art. She had a superb eye and she had great uh, intelligence. We have a lot of enthusiasm and pleasure from these pieces. I mean, we feel lots of joy inside and, and we think that we might generate some of the same feelings in other people. It's a total creative process, but the feeling is always uh, greatness. In other words, that you're walking in a hallowed place. The works are so incredibly beautiful and creative that when you walk through it, you get butterflies. The Nasher Collection is more than one of the finest collections of modern and contemporary sculpture in the world. It's also the story of a remarkable couple. The story of my parents really began with my grandparents and their parents, who were Eastern European Jewish immigrants. And my mother's family settled in Texas, and my father's family settled in Boston and New York. One of my father's most cherished memories was how his parents took him to so many cultural events in Boston. I remember walking into the Boston Museum of Art and seeing the Van Gogh postman. And that really uh, was a major happening. And it was a great inspiration. My mother was a brilliant, brilliant student. Well, she skipped two grades, graduated high school at 15, and then her parents felt she was too young to go off to college. So she spent a couple of years at Hockaday Junior College in Dallas, and then two more years at SMU before she went on to Smith College in Massachusetts. And there she studied American civilization and literature, and of course, art history. Ray graduated from the prestigious Boston Public Latin School and attended Duke University in North Carolina. And then after service in the Navy during World War II, he moved back to Boston and got a master's degree in economics from Boston University by going to night school. There's a great story about how Ray and Patsy met. In fact, it was 1948 on the eve of the presidential election. And they met at an election gathering. Ray remembers vividly being impressed by Patsy because she was the only one there who correctly predicted that Truman would defeat Dewey that night. Like many people of their generation, they had a very strong political consciousness. And in fact, they went farther than that with a deep belief in public service. Ray, in fact, uh, served as a member of the General Assembly of the United Nations for the United States. So when my parents moved down to Dallas, my father naturally started working in real estate. He had very few resources. And eventually, he saw a cotton field. And he had the kind of vision and imagination that could see a distant cotton field at the edge of Dallas and imagine it as a site for a future major shopping center. North Park was really a venue for culture. In a way, it's what my father had learned from his parents. He and my mother wanted to share those cultural events that were so important to their lives that it enriched them with the community. So they brought the art to the people. So it was a wonderful marriage of convenience. Things like the hammering men and uh, the golden hair. We knew that we had a place there so that we were able to go ahead and purchase them. That shopping mall is better in many ways than a lot of museums. The American Institute of Architects gave North Park Shopping Center the Design of the Decade Award and with that came funds to commission a new work of art. This commission from Beverly Pepper was really groundbreaking in that she wanted to conceive a work of art that would be experienced from a moving car so that as you drove along the median you would experience it almost as an exclamation point. I became part of the family. Patsy had a very good education. She was very smart, and when she did her homework, she really did her homework. I used to say to Ray, why don't you give her a title or something? You know, she's smarter than anyone's working for you. 
She was an addict at collecting in the best possible sense. Uh, and that enthusiasm for art was also part of an enthusiasm for life. She just uh, was so extremely observant, extremely smart, and really dedicated to art. In 1967, my mother surprised my father with a very special birthday present, which was a beautiful piece of sculpture by Jean Arp called Torso with Buds. That led them on. It got them interested. It was kind of budding column, uh, abstract but figurative at the same time. Uh, and, and it just really piqued their interest. And one spark, boom, they're off and running with Picasso and Moore and Hepworth and all these other great artists. One thing led to another. It just grew and grew and grew. I think that they were in the forefront of valuing sculpture and making the commitment to a very difficult art form to accumulate. And they were amazing because if you look at the way they developed as collectors, it was uh, very, very, very uh, impressive. And they realized that you could collect it. It was advantageous financially to collect sculpture versus painting. They had these beautiful spaces. North Park was crying out. They had this great idea about putting important art in public spaces. They had the great landscape at their house. I mean, anybody that went to the house was in awe because of the grounds and the beautiful installation of sculpture and the integration of inside-outside and all spaces animated with these wonderful sculptural objects. Uh, it was a breathtaking experience. In 1978, the director of the Meadows Museum, Bill Jordan, asked my parents if they would be willing to let their collection be exhibited. And they said, really? Do you think that there would be any interest in that? I mean, is it really a show? I said, I think it is. And it turned out to be spectacular. I mean, it was not a big show, but the quality was excellent. I think the public was very smitten with this collection. Patsy was the first curator of this collection. She approached it much like a curator would. She had that deep respect for the works of art, um, uh, an intense interest in the history and the context in which those works were made. Patsy was unbelievably well-read and uh, incredibly astute. This was now Patsy's career. This is where she put all her energy, and in many ways it changed her life. Patsy was a pioneer. She would progressively build her final opinion uh, herself that she would always, always share with Ray. I would say that Patsy, she led the charge in terms of looking for works for the collection, informing herself about them, researching them, and Ray was very much the, the support system in all of that and they came together to New York to the auctions and he certainly was involved in all of the bidding and the purchasing and the decision making. And then they got uh, the hint that they could be the best, you know, and they could be better than anybody in this and, and they went after it, they really did. The 1980s was really the greatest decade of growth for the collection and the Nashers traveled the world in pursuit of the masters. Henry Moore was a good friend of ours. We would go to Much Adam, England every year or two and visit with him. We were interested in a Henry Moore. It was a famous name. We thought that would be a wonderful thing to have. I had read the book about Henry Moore, and I knew he had a little room that he worked in on Sundays. So I asked him to show us that room. And in the room, he had this little form oh, six inches across, on which were some bones, I guess, fossils of some sort. And I said, oh, whenever you get that piece done, I'd like to see it. And a couple of years later, we got a phone call. The pieces were ready. There were two pieces to choose from. And we had to make a decision. And so we bought both of them. And that's the way we bought a lot of things. This is uh, Henry Moore's reclining figure, Angles. The warmth and beauty of the figures that Henry Moore created uh, was such that uh, we thought that it was a perfect piece to have as the entrance to the house. Patsy was tireless in her collecting. She went to 
all the exhibitions and galleries and museums and went to visit artists in their studios and foundries and even in quarries. We had the good fortune of meeting Scott Burton in a gallery in New York and uh, he was uh, working on uh, different uh, pieces that were totally different than anyone else and he originally did the two chairs and uh, we saw them at the Museum of Modern Art. Patsy indicated that she would love to have uh, both the chairs and a settee, which he hadn't done before. So uh, she went out with him to uh, Maryland to the uh, quarry and went down to see the uh, rock itself. It's a wonderful kind of work of sculpture where you can actually touch, sit, feel the work itself. Ray and Patsy really were a dynamic team, uh, perfect partners in collecting. But Ray would tell a funny story about how they would resolve conflicts. That was a perfect partnership. When uh, she liked something uh, very much and I didn't, we purchased it, that's right. And uh, if I liked uh, something and uh, she didn't, we talked about it, that's right. The Nashers collected numerous works by some of the most important artists of the 20th century, including Picasso and Matisse and David Smith, and especially Alberto Giacometti. I was entranced with the Giacometti shapes and what he gave to sculpture in the 20th century. These three uh, busts of Diego Giacometti, who was the brother and chief model of Alberto Giacometti, you can see the works as they uh, developed, how his hands created these figures themselves. So it's truly uh, unique works of art by an artist using the plaster in his own hands and creating the, the actual forms. Then he painted, of course, these particular three pieces. And uh, Diego, of course, was one of the great furniture makers. Diego made in the, the large table where the Matisse sculptures are in the living room. He did the uh, tables and chairs in the, uh, my office. After a number of years, we were able to go into his studio and select the works we wanted. Patsy had a natural rapport with artists and made friends with many of the ones in the collection, including one of the most shy and retiring of artists, Andy Warhol. In 1978, she had Andy paint her portrait, and then in 1980, she worked a trade with him uh, for portraits of her three daughters. We've uh, placed the Brancusi Kiss on the dining room table and uh, some of the pre-Columbian works that we found through the years. Having a piece of this quality and nature and importance you know, while one's dining, it uh, gives, gives you a totally different feeling. It uh, is startling to many visitors. This was a daring purchase at the time because it's a very late painting by Picasso made just a couple of years before his death. But overall, it has a very strong, tough, challenging quality about it. And the Nashers did not shrink from that. I like strong works of art. I don't seem to have any fear in, in gutsy paintings. Mm -hmm. Everything must have attracted me because I went back to see it three times before I took Ray there. They loved the challenging nature. I mean, it shows a taste for things, works of art, that do have a, a kind of hard edge to them. This sculpture that I'm looking at is uh, the large reclining nude of Matisse that he created in 1925. It's like a, a beautiful piece of music, the way he puts his, his arms and his legs and the form and the features and the balance of it, just like a, a remarkable uh, a symphony. This incredible decade of collecting in the 1980s culminated in the first international traveling exhibition of the Nasher Collection. 
It started at the Dallas Museum of Art and of course then had this stunning international tour going to the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., the new Reina Sofia, the great museum of contemporary art in Madrid, then perhaps one of the greatest sites for sculpture installations in the world, the Forte de Belvedere in Florence, high up on the hill, and then to Tel Aviv afterwards. One of the high points was certainly the opening in Madrid with the king and queen coming and very, very slowly and attentively walking through the, the whole installation with Ray and Patsy. It was, I think, probably one of the greatest days in their lives and a real matter of pride for all of us who had worked on the show. Patsy was such a prime mover in, in everything that happened. Unfortunately, she passed away partway through it, uh, which was a big, dark cloud, but then it became an exhibition in honor of Patsy. And what that show did was really to bring the attention to the, the uh, worldwide audience. and it, put them into the highest echelon of collecting, private collecting, anywhere in the world so that it really became possible to say that this is the finest private collection of modern sculpture any place in the world. I think Ray and Patsy have given the world of art this kind of phenomenal collection that's a record of the development of 20th century thought. I mean, intelligence is the pervasive aspect of the collection. It's not glib, it's not showy, it's intelligent. They were both deeply intelligent and perceptive. It was pretty unusual to be collecting sculpture then. They were pretty fearless about choosing that as a field and then going for it. The collection is really also an expression of love of a couple. I think that their choices of pieces of mine were pretty spectacular. They were right on. They were getting the most, uh, the densest emotional pieces that I could do. Say art, art, there. After these major traveling exhibitions of the Nasher collection, the whole world was interested, and there were major institutions in cities like London and Paris and New York that would have loved to have had the collection go there. The collection looked fabulous in the Guggenheim because it just looked like it belonged there. It would have been much easier in so many ways to have let the collection be in one of these major centers of world culture. But my parents wanted to give back to the city of Dallas, where they had become successful and where we had grown up. So we decided to make a home for the Nasher Collection in Dallas, Texas. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, gave Patsy Nasher the job of having the weather for this particular period. <laughs> And as you notice, there's not a cloud in the sky, that's all. He obviously loved uh, what had happened to him, his life. We're a team. He and Patsy and their daughters, what he had built there, he gave it to his population. So they had this complete feeling for the art and they gave it to everyone by building the Nasher Sculpture Center. So therefore, it's the time to give back to your city. It's that opportunity you have to see if you can make some contribution. And that was a dream that they had while Patsy was still alive. It's a world-class collection. To be here in Dallas, Texas is the most exciting. It gives me goosebumps all over. And you don't have to go to Washington, D.C. or to London or to New York to see world-class art. What makes this more unique than anything that I know of is a museum almost entirely dedicated to sculpture. It's a personal collecting diary or a diary about their lives in the shape of, of an art collection. For me, it's all about passion. It makes you want to go back to the studio and do great things. When I walk into the space and I see the sculptures, I already know them from books. And so when I come here, it's like I'm going home. And it, I feel like I'm coming to see my friends. This is an oasis, like no other 
sculpture park in the world. When I come here, I feel like family. I'm not in a public place, I'm in a very private backyard, someone's beautiful bucolic backyard. It's like a, a little gym right here in the middle of downtown, and we're lucky to have it. What's extraordinary about this collection is that this collection really is about man's search for his own identity uh, in three-dimensional form. Most of my work has to do with philosophy and psychology and searching for what it means to be conscious. Like Ray always said, art is for everyone. Um, one of the biggest works that uh, he acquired towards the end of his life is Jonathan Borofsky's Walking to the Sky, a uh, hundred foot tall sculpture uh, weighing 14,000 pounds that we installed here at the Sculpture Center in 2005. I like the piece because it, it, it sort of says to me, what's out there? What is out there? Where are we? Who are we? Uh, it's all a mystery and maybe this piece at one level is all of us going out to discover for ourselves this mystery. I love the way the form is moving with the hands going down the side, etc. Yeah, I mean, I think Ray was drawn to this work of art because of its, um, its broad appeal um, and its very optimistic spirit. Uh, you have these uh, figures of uh, different ages and races and genders all striding up this pole purposefully, um, reaching ever higher, and I think that really appealed to Ray. It's the great American melting pot. And my parents are an example of this great American possibility. What happened is that between Ray and Patsy, there is this other love, even beyond their children, which was this love of the art. And the love of art can do a bridge in a way that nothing else can. Well, lo and behold, here we are today in this great building. Uh, it's, it's a great story, really just amazing, American story. To have so arranged your life that that collection becomes your epitaph or your memorial, that has to be your greatest achievement. And they had the vision to make this great collection and eventually put it in the public domain. So private treasure becomes a public legacy. I have to say, though, because I'm a great admirer of North Park, that I think that is another great achievement. It is the basis of the fortune that made the collection. But it's amazing where they started. Think of this, from this cotton field that people said will never be successful, and that's truly what launched this major collection of modern sculpture that has traveled around the world and now is at home in the Nasher Sculpture Center in Dallas. What an adventure, what a journey.